Jason said that he texted you congrats about the contract and you never texted him back. That could be true. He probably got 350 texts. Congrats. Guy gets one contract all of a sudden. <laughs> Welcome to the Old Man of Three with JJ Reddick and Tommy Alter, brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 185. Tyrese Halliburton, the mailbag edition. Uh, always fun to have our friend Tyrese on. Uh, we are recording this on Monday night. He's in between games in Philly right now. Um, we get into the maxi stuff with him, and uh, they have another game in Philly tomorrow for another fun matchup. That game last night was a ton of fun to watch. Crazy, crazy. Uh, Indy, top offense in the league right now. They are the top offense in the league, which leads us to our DraftKings segment. We're going to focus on Indy. I have made a pledge this week, Tommy, just so you know. I have made a pledge to focus as much as possible on the small market teams. This morning on the Old Man and the Three Things, Nikias and Steve and I, we talked about Minnesota. We talked about Orlando. It felt good. Yeah. It feels good. So one one question, one thought slash question for you about this. Uh, Indy won national TV game all year. Minnesota, I looked this up after the segment this morning. Five, which is better than one, but it's still not great. When you think about guys like Tyrese, guys like Ant, the new faces of the league, it does feel like the league partners need to do a little better there. Here's the thing. Kevin Garnett, recently on KG Certified, came out and said, said, right now, the Indiana Pacers are my number one league pass team. For me, they're in the top five, for sure. They're a ton of fun to watch. They play an exciting brand of basketball. Yeah. How they only have one national televised game is crazy to me. They're incredibly fun. They're, it's fun. It's like if you watch them, you'll get it. They're, so they're so they're made. and but on top of that, you brought up Tyrese. Here's the thing: he, he's 23 years old. He's been an All Star. He's one of the best guards in the entire NBA. Yeah, I'm not saying the Pacers are a legacy franchise by any stretch of the imagination, but they're an important franchise in the NBA, in my estimation. They're a franchise with an incredible history. So yes, to that point, yes. The other thing is like, and, and this is, and I think Minnesota falls into this as well. These are two guys who just were two of the best players in Team USA. We're, you know, probably going to be on Team USA next summer. Like this is, these, these are the true faces of the league. And I think that they need to be highlighted a little bit more. How many uh, Tyrese Halliburton uh, segments do you think we'll get this year on first take? Um, I would go with uh, zero. <laughs> I'm gonna make one happen. Zero, unless I'm gonna you, make one unless happen. Unless you force these. So they so they they have a nine point per game offensive jump. They're six and four right now. Um, the only players I was, I was reading this before uh, we taped with them. The only players with two hundred points this year, fifty, forty, ninety are are Tyrese and Maxi. Um, what do you see about their offense? Their offense was good last year, but what do you see about their offense that that is put uh, in, in a different sort of level? Um, yeah. So. There's a there's a randomness to it. Um, for anyone listening, watching, uh, there was an article today on the Ringer.com about this. Um, there's a there's a pace to it, and there's a randomness to it. So Tyrese does have the ball a lot, but he also doesn't have the ball a lot. You know, he he kicks it ahead. You've got athletes running the court. Um, you know, hopefully as the season goes on. Obi Toppin will be continued to be in the leash. Sure, One of the guys that, that we pick. talked about where, where we felt like this was a really good fit for him at this stage in his career to expand his game. Um, you know, obviously, there's a change in the starting lineup. Buddy now coming off the bench. Um, the Miles Turner, uh, Tyrese Halliburton pick and roll has been very successful. But to me, it's just like the evolution of the group, uh, the the tactical tactical nature of Rick Carlisle. There's just a freedom to the offense. And, uh, you know, we did this mailbag and a, a couple people brought up the, the seven seconds or less Phoenix Suns who, by today's standards, would, would play at, at, I think, league worst pace, just so we're clear. Um, which is crazy. Which is crazy. <laughs> but the NBA has changed a lot. And I, I think this is partly if you have a creator and an unselfish player who can, uh, you know, make plays out of pick and roll, who can create pace with the pass, and who can shoot over 40% from three on a high volume. This is like the evolution of like how to score in the NBA, right? Mm -hmm. You're constantly making reads. You're constantly attacking closeouts. You're making the next kick out. And, and there's enough shooting on the roster that it makes it efficient. Um, but it all starts with, with Tyrese. Um, I, you know, we, 
have talked a couple times already this year about the Eastern Conference as a whole. And I don't think either of us would have recognized just how good Philly would be. Yeah. Philly has been awesome. I don't think anybody would have predicted that. Besides I, the guys in that locker room. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I, I I thought based on the preseason, the vibes, uh, the fact that they basically had moved on from Harden without trading him. I thought going into the year, they were going to be, they have Joel Embiid, like they have yeah. Tyrese Maxey. They're, they're going to be a top three or four team in the East. Now I, I think they're at least the second best, right? I mean, not based on record. Boston's really good. I've seen them play now three times. They're really good. Boston's really good. Philly's really good. Um, Cleveland, I think they're going to figure it out. Uh, the Milwaukee, they, there's just too much at the top between yeah. Giannis and De- they're going to figure it out. And, and Miami's playing really well. And it's like five, I'm five in a row. So, yeah. Somehow. So there's like there's like three there's like three spots, yeah. you know. And I look at the Pacers as a team that if they can continue to be a top two or three offense, they're going to have a chance to win every night, regardless of how bad their defense is at times. They're going to have a chance to win. Go back to that thing that Jason Kidd said to me about the Dallas Mavericks. He's like, we are really comfortable playing 125 to 120 on a nightly basis. We're yeah. comfortable doing that. We, we, we believe in our offense. We believe in our stars, right? And I think the Pacers, to a degree, fit that same mindset. Like They're comfortable playing in the 120s. So what do they need to do to improve the D? We talked about this a little bit this morning um, on three things. And we, we get into it with Terry's as well, but just sort of before getting into it with him in terms of your opinion, because it's like, how do they, how do they improve that defense to a level where if this is a top five offense, we can actually talk about them maybe even winning a playoff series or something like that? Yeah, I mean, look, certainly personnel matters in the NBA. Um, I think emphasis matters. You know, you watch them play, and there's there's an excitement when the ball goes through the hoop for the other team. There's an excitement to get the ball out of bounds yeah. and get it back up the court and go make a play. Like it's quick, right? They're getting it up quick. They're into their offense quick. You'd like to see some of the same. It, it scheme wise, look, they have Miles Turner. He's going to be in drop. He he can protect the rim. They've got Bruce Brown. He can guard multiple positions. You wonder at at some point, Jarris Walker drafted for defense, right? Aaron Neesmith is a big, big wing. Like, I think there's enough there where they can build a decent defense. They don't have to be a top 15 defense. They don't. Their offense is that good. Um, right now on DraftKings Sportsbook, by the way, uh, they have currently the best odds. They're at minus 105 to participate in the play in tournament. And they have the best odds to make the playoffs once the plan is settled. So there, there's, I, I think, a strong possibility, assuming health, that this team is in the playoffs. You go back to last year, Tyrese gets hurt in that Knicks game. They were the fifth seed. They were in the playoffs. They had a winning record. I think they were 24 and 18. Um, they have a great coach. They have a superstar player. I mean that. I don't yeah. like. I don't. I don't use that term lightly. Like, Tyrese is great. Um, there's a bunch of superstars across the league. I, yeah. I, I, there's a difference between a star and a superstar. You know. I was a legend. I was a star. I was not a superstar. No, I'm just kidding. Legends. <laughs> Jason edited that out. You're a superstar in some people's minds. That's good. It's staying it. It's a joke. It's, it's a joke. Staying it. It's staying it. What about um? What about Matherin? Um, he's played well for them so far. We obviously have been on the show last year. Um, is there a is there something where you can see him taking a leap? I don't know about a. The- I don't know about a leap. I don't know about a leap. I I I, I like that he's starting. I think that's a that's a natural thing to do for a second year guy. Um, you know, over the course of an eighty two game season, I, I think you look at young players and efficiency. And that's where I think as the season went on last year, efficiency numbers went down, the shooting numbers went down. He clearly has a ton of talent, right? He he's he's a downhill driver. He can finish. He's got great footwork when he does attack. You know, I, I think in this offense, especially with Buddy out, if he can make high thirty high thirty percent from three on four or five attempts a game for a season, like to me that's that's the growth, right? Yep. Um, so to me, it's like efficiency. That's a natural evolution, I think, for a young scorer in the NBA. But I like their team a lot. I do, and uh, and I'm excited to see 
I think I'm excited to see them throughout this year. I'm excited to see Orlando throughout this year. Uh, we talked about them today. There's certainly a lack of shooting right now on that team, which is is sort of the cause for concern, but they're a top five defense. I think these early season numbers, again, small sample size, 10, 11 games, they can get skewed a little bit, yeah. right? With with the oh, we're top five offense. Top five. But like, I'm pretty confident that Boston's going to have a top five offense and a top 10, top five defense. Like, yeah. Houston is another team, right? They, they, right now, they have both a top 10 offense and a top 10 defense. If that plays out over the course of the season, guess what? Houston's in the playoffs. They're going to be a playoff team, right? But I think early in the season, there, there can be some skewed, right? You have a 155-point game. Your offense is going to be pretty good for those first 10 games. It's going to look really good in a spreadsheet. <laughs> It just is. <laughs> it just is. They are like it just. They are objectively a top five league pass team. They're, every night, whether they're getting lit up or they're doing it to somebody else, it's always fun. Yeah. Have they played? Have they played one boring game yet? No, I don't. I don't no, know that they have. Ev- everything is is a, is just a shootout. I I by the way I, it's funny because I I I watched the Brooklyn Nets play on Friday or I called the Brooklyn Nets game on Friday in Boston. And then I watched them play uh, Sunday. And they're also random. Super random. But it doesn't, it doesn't look as good or it's not as entertaining no. as the Pacers for some reason. But it is still, there's still a lot of random with Brooklyn. Well, they too. muck it up and stay in basically every game. I mean, the, yeah. games, the, sun, the game yesterday, the Wizards game, was one of the worst games. Thanks, I was there. Yeah, one of the worst games I've seen in a long time. I th- I do think with Brooklyn though, bringing like Claxton being back, I mean, he's yeah. so good. I think Claxton's so good. He's so good. They just have to get. They just have to get healthy. I mean, yeah. they haven't been close to healthy. And when they're healthy, it's going to be really interesting because they have a lot of good. They're like a, they're sort of like with Houston. You have a lot of good players. How do you make that fit? Uh, last thing before we get to Tyrese in the mailbag, which thank you again for all your questions you sent in on Twitter. Uh, we had a special. Uh, email last second edition uh, from I hate Google Docs at gmail.com that sent in a couple questions. You got a lot of questions off. <laughs> you got a lot of questions off. I'm not sure how that happened. Favoritism, I'm not sure. I know we tabled the MVP talk. Where do you think Ky- Tyrese right now is? This is funny because we talked specifically with him about not. <laughs> no, but we're not going to talk about the MVP. We're not going to name our t- who's in the MVP conversation. Wait, so where is he Where is he in the on the odds? Yeah, where is he? 20th. 20th. 20th right now. How do you? What, 20th best what, odds. What, what do you think that's fair? I said we're not going to talk about the MVP. I'm just saying. It's you just interesting. Bring the word MVP up and say we're not going to talk about it. We're not talking. Fine. About okay. It. Well, let's just hold this. We remember this for four months from now. I think that that's fine. 20th, uh, 20th. I, tru- I truly, I truly, I truly enjoy talking to Tyrese Halliburton for an hour, and we got a lot of fun stuff for you in this episode. Uh, Thanks again to DraftKings Sportsbook. Get in on the NBA action. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code JJ. New customers can get $150 instantly in bonus bets for betting just $5 on basketball. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code JJ. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, Kansas, 21 and up age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See sportsbook.draftkings.com slash basketball terms for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Let's get to our conversation with all-star point guard Tyrese Halliburton. All right, let's welcome in Tyrese Halliburton. Tyrese, good to see you, my friend. We have not had you on in a while. A lot has happened in your life. Massive contract. It's massive. Don't give me that face. It's massive. (laughs) USA basketball. And really, truly, I mean this. A fucking awesome start to the season. So... Excited to have you on for this mailbag episode. Tommy, always good to see you. I'm going to start. Uh, this was a late addition to the mailbag. I'm going to start. This is from I hate Google Docs at gmail.com. Very interesting email address. <laughs> um, 
A lot of chatter, including from us today on the old man of the three things about Tyrese Maxey. Um, you are a very cerebral guy. You watch the NBA every night. Um, you played against him last night. What are you seeing from him in terms of the game and in terms of the confidence level? Yeah, I think he's playing at probably the, the highest his confidence level has ever been. Um, I think that he's really in a good space mentally and with his game in the sense of he's so fast that picking him up higher up the floor is not beneficial for you. But at the same time, if you don't pick him up high enough, he has range and Joel sets elite screens uh, if you're not high enough and through the screen. Um, so I think that he's become a really tough cover and with his speed and the separation he can get on his step backs and things like that. Uh, I think he's been really good. And I think that Joel genuinely loves Tyrese. Like ever since I've came to the NBA, their relationship has always been like, there's like big brother, little brother. They're always like arguing, but in this, like I love and Joel wants to see him do well. And, um, I think that's been really beneficial as well as Joel is doing everything in his power to, you know, he's still being Joel and B scoring. 35, 40 a night. There's nothing you can do about that. But when Tyrese gets going, now you got two guys. I mean, they had both had 25 and a half last night. They combined for 87 last night against us. Um, they're really they're really tough to cover together. So um, Tyrese is playing really well right now. When he came on with us a couple of weeks ago, he talked about just the weirdness of the start of his career and how he just never had a defined role. Do you feel this? You've known him for a long time. You're good friends with him. Do you feel like even just seeing him last night, like him being the guy there now and having this defined role has changed the way he's approaching the game? I think so. I think so. I think what about Tyrese is he's such a good dude, and I think everybody loves being around him. Uh, I think he's an elite teammate that I think from 1 to 15, everybody just loves playing with him and wants to see him do well. And I think now that he's 100% the second guy, um, you know, so he, he can get going with Joel on the floor and you know that Joel is not going to play the first six of the second and the first six of the fourth. Um, that's really when Tyrese gets going and the guys are hunting him to score and stuff like that. So uh, I think it's been really beneficial for him. I mean, I think JJ knows that anybody knows who's in the NBA. Once you kind of know your role and what a team expects out of you, it's, I feel like it's easier to do versus it kind of being back and forth wishy-washy between not knowing exactly what they need from you. So I feel like that's really helping him in his career and um, he'll be an all-star this year, no question about it. I think it's not just the defined role. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying you weren't saying this, but I think it's not just the defined role, specifically with Maxi and for any player that either has like an elevated season or goes to a new situation and all of a sudden is like almost like a different player. And I'm not saying Maxi is a different player, but certainly the production and the playmaking and all that is is elevated. I think it's the freedom that comes with an elevated role but also the empowerment that comes from a coach. And in this case, Nick Nurse, just empowering him, some by necessity because Harden's gone. Um, but it, it, it's there. It's not just like, oh, this is what I want you to do night to night. It's knowing like, motherfucker, I'm, I'm going to have the ball in my hands and I'm going to do it. You can probably speak to that as well when you go to Indy. I, I, by the way, I, Tommy and I, everybody here, we read the ringer.com article on you today. The love fest. It was intense, man. <laughs> it was intense. Like almost to the point where I'm like, did Tyrese's PR person it was a pay lot. the writer? It was a lot. <laughs> it, was a good, it was a good article. It was a good article. <laughs> great article. Great article. Tyrese Ghost wrote it. <laughs> uh, I've got to actually, sorry, not me. I hate Google Docs uh, at gmail.com has a couple follow up questions. Um, number one. <laughs> Number one, as it relates to uh, another team you guys have played, and that is the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, I have spoken about what I'm seeing on film from their defense, uh, which has been different, and, and they've tried to make some adjustments with Brooke. What did you see on the court? Um, you played against the Milwaukee Bucks a ton in your career, um, have had some some big games against them prior but just in terms of their defensive coverages and the reads that you were able to make in that game, what was different about it? Well, I mean, the most <clears throat> the most obvious part that wasn't there was probably 
uh, obviously Drew's not there anymore, right? And I think what he brought to the table is he's going to guard the best player every night, regardless of position. Um, and you know, you know, you got to be, be prepared for that. He's probably the most elite defensive player in the NBA. So no matter the defense or the team that he's on, he leaves, there's going to be a gap, right? And I, I think that it's interesting because we really were going at them in their man-to-man coverage. Um, obviously, Brooke is in a deep drop for the majority of the game, and I feel like I excel best against teams who are in a deep drop. Um, so that really got us going. We got stops early that allowed us to play in transition. Um, but then they went to zone, and it felt like they were – it felt like when teams go zone, it's kind of like a – I don't want to say a last-ditch effort, but against us, it feels like you're doing it just to slow us down. And and I feel like in the moment, like, dang, this zone's kind of working against us. But then I go back and watch the film, and I feel like we're really getting whatever shot we wanted to. We just weren't making shots. Like, Buddy had a couple open threes. Uh, I think he was like two for 12 maybe that night or something like that. Uh, I missed a couple open ones. I feel like we missed a couple open threes, but I feel like that point of attack defender is is not there as much with Drew gone, and that's just that's just the fact of it. And I think that Giannis is an elite uh, weak side defender. I think Brooke is an elite weak side defender, um, but I think missing Drew uh, hurts them. And so I'm I'm looking forward to obviously playing them in, in uh, full strength, but it is it is different when you play against them because uh, I only played against I didn't play against Milwaukee at all last year. But the year before, it's always like when I go play Milwaukee, I'm at home and I'm like, I'm, like, I'm, I'm up for this game. But it's like, I got to really lock in because, you know, we got Drew and like, it's going to be tough. And I got to figure out the nuances and how I'm going to get them off me and all these different things. Uh, I've, that, that's, that, there's a big gap there. And that's, that's hard for any team to, to make up. I knew you missed the TJ McConnell game last year. I did not realize that you, you also missed every game against Milwaukee. Uh, that's every my game. bad. Yeah. TJ McConnell, what do you have, 25 in the first half, something like that? Yeah, it was a twenty. Yeah, it might have been thirty. He was. It was twenty five. It, it was. I think it was twenty five. It was twenty five. Ty, you didn't play when you when you guys lost to Boston this year. But what was your thought when the, when the dust settled with the Dame trade and then Drew ended up there, knowing and you know we 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 talk about how good Drew is every episode of the show, but knowing adding a piece like him to a team like that, like what was your initial thought? And then even just watching watching that team um, from the sidelines, you know, seeing what they have now. In the moment, I mean, we lost by fifty. Uh, in the moment, I was like, man, I don't know. They're, they're tough They're tough for anybody to beat. I'm like, man, who's going to beat them? Uh, they got multiple. I mean, Jason's had 50 in the NBA. Jalen's had 50 in the NBA. Porzingis could get 50. Um, and Drew's had 50. We, he gave us 50 last year at home. So they got like three or four dudes that can that have gotten 50 in the NBA are elite scorers. Um, and then partner that with Derek White, who's – probably one of, if not the best role player in the NBA, uh, knocking down open shots, can defend at a high level. I think what they bring to the table is interesting because they have four dudes that can defend and score the ball. Um, we play such randomness offensively, and we're moving blur screens and flares and all this stuff. Um, and usually when you're playing a team with switches, everything, you can usually find the holes in that with point switching and all that stuff. The more random you play, the better. Uh, but it, watching it, it was like, wow, they're they're really good. And Drew kind of covers up a lot of holes, again, being probably the best defender in the NBA. And I think with Porzingis at the rim, another elite uh, elite rim protector, not even to mention Al Horford and, and guys they got coming off the bench. So um, I'm looking at them as I, I see them, Philly, and Denver as really the team to beat in the NBA. Um, so I look forward to competing against them and uh, seeing how the year goes for them. This Rookie Spotlight is presented by Smartwater Alkaline. When it comes to rookies elevating their game, the number one draft pick, Victor Wembenyama, has delivered right out of the gate. Averaging 16.7 rebounds, two steals, and two blocks a game, Wemby is off to an impressive start. I mean, the guy's averaging four stocks a game. That's steals and blocks. I've loved what he's doing on the defensive end, particularly on the help side. Like all rookies, he's getting used to guarding one-on-one in space, but I expect Wemby to use his length and size to offset some of that physicality. The one part of his game is the turnovers. That is something that happens to rookies when they get sped up a little bit. I saw his debut. He had several turnovers that game. He's pressing at times as a rookie. Let the game come to him. He's too good. He's too big. And I expect him to continue to improve throughout his rookie campaign. For Wemby and all people looking to elevate in all areas of their lives, look no further than Smart Water Alkaline. They've upped the game so you can up your game too. Grab one at a store near you. 
OM3 fans, I want to talk to you about my favorite craft clothing brand, Faraday. I'm really excited about this. Started by twin brothers, Alex and Mike, in 2013, the brand is now celebrating 10 years of what they're all about, making things that last, caring for people on the planet, and always spreading good vibes. I've worn Faraday for about five or six years now, and I love Faraday because they're backed by their guarantee of quality. They stand behind everything they make 100%. I'm all in on Faraday's laid back vibe meets classic styling. And if you're new to the brand, you have to check out their iconic legend sweater shirt. It's a must have for the season crafted with a fabric that's impossibly soft, endlessly versatile, and unlike any flannel shirt you've worn before. With over 1,000 five-star reviews, it's the perfect five-star gift for yourself this season. Faraday is a family-built, values-driven, premium clothing brand meant to outfit you for life's great moments. I got myself a couple flannels for the upcoming fall season. Not only do these things look great, they are so comfortable. For listeners of the show, Faraday Brand has an exclusive offer of 20% off your first order when you enter the promo code JJ at checkout. Go to FaradayBrand.com slash JJ and check them out. All right, let's get into the mailbag for real. Uh, I may have made up those questions. I'm not... <laughs> Not really sure. I actually I, was going to ask you about this and and be and anyways. So I'm glad that um, someone wrote this in. It's the shorts at it's the shorts on Twitter. Uh, the soft techs we're seeing again this year are not entirely new, but how much insight do the team's players have on points of emphasis from the officials before the start of this each season? And are you adequately briefed on what behaviors could constitute a T? Um, I can answer that first part real quick. Yeah, we, we talk points of emphasis, meeting with the refs every year. We watch a video. All teams are required to do it. Um, if there's any new uh, behaviors that could lead to a T, they let us know that. But generally speaking, year to year, it's the same. I do want to bring this taunting issue up, though, um, because I hearken it, and I want to get your thoughts on this, Tyrese. I hearken it to these new flopping rules where – they have this STEM concept, secondary, theatrical, exaggerated, and movement. That is the sort of guideline for calling a flopping foul. They should have the same sort of guideline for taunting. I don't get why mean mugging now is a, is a fucking technical. Anthony Edwards last night, ridiculous. Giannis the other night, ridiculous. Austin Rivers had a great, great tweet about it. Everybody in the NBA co-signed it. This is what the players want. If you get yammed on, you deserve at least a mean mug. For sure. At a minimum. At a minimum. <laughs> at a minimum. Come on. We've all played basketball in different environments other than an NBA arena. Every fan that has played basketball has crossed somebody up, has dunked on something, whatever it may be, blocked a shot. It's part of the game. If it's extra, if it's exaggerated, Theatrical, all of that, by all means, tee them up. But can we stop with the mean mug tees? Tyrese, I don't need you to get your thoughts on this, man. <laughs> uh, I like I like that tangent. I love that. Um, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think that the fans pay to see that. Um, it's a part of the entertainment side of the game. And it, I feel like as long as it's, like you said, it's nothing theatrical, it's nothing dramatic, and it's not slowing down the game. Right. A lot of times when dudes are mean mugging or celebrating or whatever, if I can get the outlet and just throw it out, then I'm not even paying attention to that. So why does it matter? You know what I mean? They're they're get, not getting back on defense for them. So they're not set. That's the way I look at it. Um, and like you said, I feel like as players, we all we all want that. We love that about the game. Right. Like, I don't I don't see a reason why to take it out. And I mean, we played Giannis the night after the mean mug. And everybody was like, you're going to get angry Giannis. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, okay, let's see what that looks like. And then 54. Right, you know what I mean? Right. It's like, okay, now we see what happens. So, uh, of course, now I'm a fan of don't <laughs> don't kick people out or, or whatever the case may be for a taunting issue. But I do think that – I think we have the best refs in the world. Don't get me wrong. But I do think that when a guy already has a tech, a superstar like that, you got to let it go. Like I feel like – if that ref, I don't even know who it was, in that moment could could take that back, he would have because kicking somebody out for that reason I think is dumb. A tech is one thing, but kicking somebody out I think is a whole different game. And it needs to be something 
um, very dramatic and very unnecessary uh, to kick somebody out. I, I feel like the refs have a good feel about that usually. If I'm not mistaken, if I'm if, if I'm mistaken on this, please, by all means, call me out. But I think about some of the iconic dunks. Uh, Shaq on Chris Dudley. I don't think that was called a technical when he when he basically set, stood over him, sat on him, whatever. W- was not a tech, correct. Hippin' on Ewing may have been a technical. I'm not sure. But my point in all of that is we get labeled now as like the NBA is soft. Yeah, right. And some of this is like, no, it's not us. You go around, I guarantee you, if you did a, a poll of 450, however many there are now with the two ways, if you did a poll of the NBA players and like, should Anthony Edwards have a tech for that? Should Giannis have gotten a tech? A hundred percent of guys would say no. A hundred percent. We need to get this fixed, 100%. Tyrese. You're the active 100%. player. You need to get this fixed. I know, I know. We'll, we'll talk about it. And I, I think that, I mean, if that question was asking if that was in the points of emphasis, it definitely was not. The points of emphasis this year was fully focused on the flopping aspect. Um, but I do think even sometimes like that, I think somebody just got recently got a uh, the flopping tech after the game, if I'm not mistaken. Um, how do you, I don't I don't know. How do you it think, doesn't make it doesn't always make sense to me. How do you think the flopping stuff is going to go as we get closer to the playoffs? Like imagine a imagine a playoff game getting swung with a with a tee like this. Yeah. It'll, It'll be interesting. Um, I think they 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 did show one flopping clip in the points of emphasis. It was when James hit the move on Marcus Smart and he kind of slid all the way out of bounds. You know what I'm talking about? Was that that was the playoffs last year, right? The game one maybe. Um, that was in that was in the points of emphasis. They said that would be a flop. I'm 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 interested because it's usually the 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 defenders that get under people's skin, right? Those are usually the guys who get called for the flopping text. And I, I think it can be shooters sometimes, but at the same time, I haven't really seen it called that much. So I'm not really all that concerned about it. I think that it's something that the league wanted and just kind of something that we have to abide by. Was but that, understanding they just that. Pissed. They just, they just that, pissed the shooter thing. You, you, was, that a, was that a dig at me? That was. I I think so. I, I shoot two now. Happy. But I, play with, I play with Buddy. Buddy's, buddy be flopping, falling. I had a three against Charlotte and tried to complain. And uh, the ref said to me, he's like, that could be a flop. I was like, okay, you could have called it. I mean, don't tell me it was a flop. Call it if it's a flop. Um, All right. I like this one from uh, Not Really Zeus. His name is Ben Harvey. Man, I, <laughs> we've been doing these Twitter handles all day for stuff. Um, there's some good ones. Uh, th- this is a, I actually, I actually really like this question. Um, how big of a difference is it being on a losing team versus a winning team? What's the locker room like on a winning team versus a losing team? Can you feel the difference in vibe from a winning franchise and a losing franchise? Thanks. Thank you, Ben, for the question. <laughs> Tyrese, <laughs> I did not know this. I did not put all this together until I read the ringer.com, but uh, you have ahead. not been on a winning team since your freshman year at Iowa State. It's been a while. But, I still think you can answer this question because this is how I would answer this question. I've been on winning teams where the vibe sucked. I've been on losing teams where the vibe was great. I've been on winning teams where the vibe was very indifferent. I don't think it's about losing and winning all the time. Winning certainly cures a lot of problems in terms of interpersonal dynamics and people's enjoyment day-to-day of the job. But a good group is a good group. And when you're going to work every day with people that you would genuinely enjoy being around and you know that you're building for something, um, that to me is a form of winning. And yes, I sound like Giannis and failure and all that bullshit, but I truly believe that. Like, not every team's going to win. Not every team has a chance to win it all. And to me, it's more about like, do I fuck with these people? Yes. I, if I fuck with these people, like I'm going to enjoy this. That is a win for me. That's fair. I, I look at it as, so I, 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 I got to go with my experience. So my rookie year, um, I was a rookie in the NBA, so it didn't matter what the locker room was like. I was going to enjoy myself. And uh, 
like we weren't winning and that that was not fun but and like we felt like oh we could get in the plan it's the first year of the plan uh but we were not going to get in the plan and i was a rookie and so i just had fun regardless but going into year two uh luke got fired it was not fun um we wanted to win and i feel like we felt like, oh, we're going to, you know, be different this year. But it just – it kind of felt like there was this cloud. And I've talked about this before. Like, it felt like there was this cloud and everything that happened was just like, oh, we're the Kings, you know. And they've turned it around. They're a great team now. Um, but for me, year three last year with Indy, definitely the most fun I've had playing basketball in a long time. Um, the vibe was awesome. I think everybody just kind of felt rejuvenated to a sense. And we had a bunch of young guys with new opportunity – um, and I think it's continuing into this year because we have dudes that just get along. And like you, I feel like you kind of alluded to that, but when you have a group of people who like really get along and genuinely want to see each other succeed, it's a little different. And I feel like my team is uh, majority all young dudes who feel like they still have something to prove in this in this league. And there's not very many egos. And I know uh, when teams have older guys who feel like, um, you know, they still have more to, to, to do and all that stuff that, that that's when it's hard. But for us, we have a bunch of young guys who just want to see each other succeed. And we're a deep team. We play 10 guys, most games, um, and guys are competing, but it's been all in good competition. And I feel like that's helped. And I think that we had James Johnson last year, who was a really good vet for us, who kept things high and the spirit good. And I feel like that's continued into this year. Um, so it's been, it's been a lot of fun these last, these last two years, but um, yeah, I would, I would like to get back, back to winning as soon as possible. I, I want to, one more point I want to make, I, I was having lunch today with somebody uh, who is in, in the NBA world and we were talking about roster construction and we were talking about the draft and you know, what you look for and how it's such an imperfect science and all that stuff. And something I said to him, something I said, said, said to a lot of people like an underrated part of a player's profile is joy it's something the ringer talked about with you i'm not trying to gas you up here but <laughs> no i but i mean that um like i remember jimmy jimmy said this about it was like the greatest compliment that a teammate ever gave me it was when i was in philly my second year and he he said to the media something like um i love being jj's teammate because he's the same guy every day you know he comes in he's smiling he's talking and i think about a guy on your team like tj mcconnell right I think about one of my teammates, Tobias Harris. It's like those guys, those personalities, they're as important as anything else in the NBA. They really are. It's 82 games. It's literally seven to 10 months out of the year that you're together every single day with people. And if there's two or three guys on a roster that come to work every day and are joyful... Like, I know it sounds silly because we're all men trying to compete for something, but it matters. And it's actually contagious. I think it's contagious. Yeah. It changes the whole vibe for sure. Just the energy. And, you know, everybody goes through a part in a season where, you know, you lose a couple in a row, you lose ones that you should have, and uh, you're not liking where you're at right now. But it's all about like responding. And, and you can just feel the energy in the whole facility from top down. And, and that starts with the players. But like, I feel like it makes, it makes it more enjoyable for the training staff and the weight staff and everybody. And that just keeps the, the whole energy up. So I feel like that has a lot to do, do with you, it. Do you think with this particular team, you guys, as we are taping this, are the best offense in the NBA? Do you think th that the way you guys play offense uh, leads to more joy just with how fun it is? I mean, it's fun to watch, much less play. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I feel like we're putting good energy in the ball. And I think that I think we're number one in assists right now. So the ball's being moved and, and everybody's getting their opportunity. And I think that that helps. Um, I think we all just play the game the right way. And when the ball's hopping like that and everybody's kind of playing for each other, that helps a lot. And we don't have necessarily anybody who's, you know, ISO heavy or, you know, not looking to pass out of two or anything like that. And um, yeah, I, I think that that has a lot to do with it. I feel like it's kind of started with me and ran through our roster of just see, wanting to see each other succeed and, um, you know, enjoying people's success. Uh, Dario Calabrese wrote in, he said, how did the summer with Team USA affect your start to the season on a physical level? Yeah, so we got back from USA, um, and I was I, I was thinking about, like, how am I going to take time before the season starts? And our trainer at USA, Jason, he's with the Rockets. He was like, you need to take a couple weeks off and don't touch a basketball. Um, so I didn't touch a basketball for, like, two weeks. Uh, I lifted every day. I went into the facility. 
when I got in town, we already had out of our 18 guys. I think we had 14 in town. So dudes were already playing pickup and all that stuff. And I was part of me was like, man, I want to run. Like I want to get in. But uh, I understood that my goal this year is to be able to play as many games as possible. Obviously getting injured last year, that was frustrating. And I want to be able to play as much as I can. So took a couple weeks off, didn't touch a basketball, just lifted, then slowly got back into stuff. Uh, we did a team mini camp and that was the first time that I had played um you know, since USA. Uh, but I felt fine going into the year. I uh, was just about getting my rhythm back. And I think that early in the year, like the first two or three games, I was shooting awful from the field. And uh, we were winning, but I was like, man, my shot don't feel right, whatever. And then somebody pointed out to me, like kind of all of us USA guys were kind of starting the year like trash. Just, and I don't know what that's from. Like we just weren't making shots. Uh, and I felt like it took somebody to get the lid off. I think like Apollo or something hit a game winner against the Jazz or something like that happened. And I feel like that kind of got the lid off for me. I don't know how everybody else felt, but um, physically I felt I felt fine, but my game was not fine the first couple of games. It was actually just the residual effect of losing to Germany and Canada. <sighs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. True. I'm just kidding. True. Hey, actually, you brought you up knew, you brought the shit. You knew it was coming. You knew you you knew, you knew, I, knew it was, I knew it was, was coming. <laughs> Tyrese, I'm, a, I'm an asshole. Like, what, what do you say? Um, you brought up the shooting, and uh, we asked you this. I think of the very first time you ever came on the podcast, which was February of your rookie year. Um, but this is from Darren Harris, eleven. Uh, the unorthodox shooting form. Where did it originate from? Did anybody try to change it? Um, watching the game last night, by the way, I, my favorite part of the Tyrese Halliburton experience is your free throw routine and your free throw shot. I don't know why I just enjoy it. Cause when the camera zooms in on you, um, you, you kind of st stick your tongue to the side and it's like, it's this, it's like you're shooting a beer pong <laughs> ball or something like a ping pong ball. You're playing beer pong. Uh, but where, where did it originate from? And I know the answer to the, did anybody try to change your shot, but just take us through this. Yeah. Naturally when I was a kid, I just wasn't strong enough. Um, and I'm sure you guys could pull clips and put it on the video of me in high school. Like even to my freshman year, catching the ball, having to kind of dip it to my knees to get it up, to shoot it. Uh, it's cause I wasn't strong enough. And then as I got older, I was strong enough, but I just, that was what felt good for me. Um, I'm in it and I started working with a different coach who runs my AU program now. It was my trainer growing up, uh, Brian Jonikin, known in Wisconsin as Coach B. And we used to mic and drill all day. I'm talking about we start practice with like 10 sets of 50 in a row. And like, and we did, I mean, everybody does mic and where you got to, you know, lay it up on both sides. But like, you know, usually people catch it and they drop it to their stomach or whatever. Well, like he sits under the basket and puts his hand out. So I got to catch it above my shoulders and just put it up and kind of get that repetition of just finishing above my shoulders. Um, and I think that that kind of made me feel strong enough and made me feel comfortable with catching the ball high and keeping it high and not dipping as much on my shot. Um, and then naturally it was just a progression from there. Felt more comfortable with it. Um, started jumping on my pull up, which you love to talk about. Hey, you hit, you hit <laughs> a three the other night. Where you jumped? I did. I did. In the, from the like, right I, side, I, I right in front of the bench. <laughs> I, like, I can't wait to talk to JJ about this. Um, but yeah, no, I think that, and then, and then everybody's tried to change it. When I got to college, uh, Coach Hobbs was our uh, was a coach there. Like the first couple of weeks, he worked out with me and was trying to change it. And then he was like, I'm not going to change it. You make it at a high clip. And then I got to the NBA. I told this story too. Uh, the Warriors were after me pretty hard and, Coach Kerr called Coach Bolton uh, when I got drafted. It was like, we, we love him, love his jumper. Don't touch it. Like, it's going to go in. Um, and I started working with Rico Hines. And he was like, first, he was like thinking he might change it. And after like a couple of days, he's like, we don't got to worry about your jumper. That's going to go in. Um, so it, I just kind of kept it from there and uh, adjust accordingly when needed. My, my outside observation again, um, I, I would, first of all, if, if I would, I wouldn't change your shot either. But um, I, I always tell people like, the aesthetic of a jump shot doesn't really matter. What matters to me, and there's a few exceptions to this, um, what matters to me is the linear motion. So how you get from point A to point B, which is the shooting pocket, and what your shooting pocket actually is. And both of those things for you are 10 out of 10, right? Your your left hand is whatever, but it goes in. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it. Um, had a thought, Tyrese, 
because in the last, I would say in the last year, I've talked to people who work for some of the 10 teams that passed up on you in the draft, or sorry, 11 teams. You were 12, right? 12, yeah. Yeah, so some of the 11 teams that passed up on you on the draft. And every everybody I talked to is like, is like, uh, yeah, we had we had Halliburton uh, three on our board, uh, but it wasn't my decision. It wasn't my decision. <laughs> or it'd be like, we yeah. had Halliburton five <laughs> five on our board, but we already we already had a guard. We had a guard, so like, you know, it wasn't my decision or whatever. Have you had anybody around the league come up to you and be like, we fucked up? Yeah, for sure. I'm not gonna say who, but of <laughs> course that's happened. Um, People know, people know. I, it was so interesting during that process because like it felt like the biggest knock on me. It wasn't like it wasn't anything that made sense. It wasn't like my defense. It wasn't I'm not strong enough. It was like they had worries about my like uh self creation, playmaking ability and shot making, which I was like, What? And that didn't make sense in the moment, it still doesn't make sense now. Uh, but obviously I've taken a leap that, and it's hard to, you know, evaluate how hard talent's going to work and all, all that stuff. But, um, yeah, yeah. People have definitely came to me from the majority of those teams for sure. Do you ever feel like you just can't seem to find a way to permanently get rid of your breakouts? Well, it's time to meet your new best friend, Lumen Skin and its charcoal face wash. Lumen is a skincare line crafted especially for men who want to look and feel their best. Lumen's charcoal face wash purifying wash designed for men for all skin types. It lathers to a creamy foam and gently removes excess oil and dirt in order to rebalance the skin. It is a daily detox for your face. I've been using the charcoal face wash for a couple months and it's officially a part of my daily Daily routine. I literally can't travel without this stuff. The best part, Lumen will let listeners of this podcast try this product for free. Head over to lumenskin.com slash V3 and get your free trial of Lumen's Charcoal Face Wash and their other amazing products now. Say goodbye to irritated, oily skin and say hello to a new, refreshed you. Don't wait any longer. Your skin will thank you. That is Lumen, L-U-M-I-N, skin.com slash T-H-E-T-H-R-E-E. Um, this is for, for both you guys, from Andrew Livingston. Who are your surprise all-star picks? For me, it's just, I love Andrew. Loyal follower of the pod, loyal listener. Appreciate you. It's just too early for me. It's just too early. And Tommy and I have placed a moratorium on MVP talk until after game 50. We will not be discussing MVP on the podcast. There are a number of uh, other awards and other things that we will discuss, but after last year, <laughs> we're gonna stay away from the MVP big, discussion big stay away. until after game 50. And I think for me, we're recording this, most teams have played 10 games. So that's roughly, I don't know, 12 or 13% of the season. I think 12.5% roughly of the season. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to say by game 25, um, which would be like mid December, I will be comfortable discussing all-star appearances. I always think Tyrese, I actually, there's a question for you. Uh, you can answer this question about the all-star thing, but this is a question for you. How do you sort of judge your own play and your team's play? Because for me, I always looked at the season in like 20 game segments. As it got further down the line, I didn't want to overreact to 10 games early. I didn't want to overreact to, you know, five games in January. Like for me, it was always like 20 games, game 20, game 40, game 60. All right, now I'm in this in the push for the last 20. I never was like, I didn't want to overreact to like a small stretch of games where there's so many different variables within an NBA season, road game, home game, uh, seven game road trip. Uh, somebody's hurt. Joel Embiid's out one game. All of a sudden I'm not getting the looks I'm normally getting. Like, it's just not worth it to me. Yeah, I would agree. I would say like 15 to 20 games. That's the way I view it. Um, cause right now it, 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 in this moment, like, again, we talked about not winning a ton, like in this moment, we're six and four. I feel like we should be like eight and two right now. Um, we probably like, we should have won that Charlotte game. Should have won Chicago. We feel like we should be eight and two right now, and that's like 
if you like panic about that, then you're probably not, it's, it's not going well. Um, but I, I try to look at like 15 to 20 games at a time, kind of similar to you and the all-star talk. Like it's, it's any, it's easy for anybody to have, you know, a good first 10 or bad first 10 or whatever guys will turn it around. Like the Clippers aren't going to look like this all year. I, I highly doubt it. They'll figure it out. Um, but I, I think like, I don't want, I can't necessarily answer that question, like surprise all-star um, but I will say that I feel like Scotty Barnes has a good chance to be an all-star this year. He's been balling early this year. Um, Cade Cunningham has looked really good. Uh, it's good to see my boy healthy and doing his thing because he's been capable of this. It's just good to see him healthy and playing out there. Um, and then, I mean, not a surprise necessarily, but I would say that the Timberwolves will have two all-stars this year. I think Ant's obviously for sure, but I think that Rudy is having another uh, depoy season in the first 10 not trying to overreact, but I think he's looked good these first 10 games, and uh, I, I I could see them having two all-stars. That's fair. That's fair. Um, Tommy, I'm going to ask one more real quick because I don't want to let this one go because we were on the topic, and I had it deep within the uh, 172 questions I have in front of me that we're picking and choosing. Um, going back to the shooting form, for both of us, what is your Mount Rushmore of great shooters with funky shots? Uh, do you consider Steph a funky shot? I personally don't. But I don't either. Put, put him I, on I your Mount Rushmore then. It's 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 different forms. I mean, when he first came, he was like, it's, it's unorthodox, I guess. You know, I, I don't I don't know what's considered. I got to hear your answer for me to answer it because uh, I don't know who necessarily has a, a funky shot or not. Okay, my, my four, um, Reggie Miller. Larry Bird, Michael Red, and a guy who was one of my big influences, and that was Peja Stojakovic. Peja, if you remember, his follow-through was sideways. He really right. snapped it sideways. Michael Red, a little bit of an overhead slingshot. Larry Bird, kind of the right-handed version of that. And then Reggie, God knows what he was doing with his left arm. All those guys. <laughs> but all those guys, I mean, you know, Four of the greatest shooters ever, right? I put Larry on the normal Mount, Mount Rushmore uh, with is, with Clay and Steph and Ray, probably. Is Joker in the conversation? I had I thought about him, but when I thought of great shooters, I I thought more volume threes. But yeah, Joker yeah. is a great shooter, and I similar like overhead, little funky, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Reggie for sure. Michael Red, Wisconsin legend. Um. For sure, you got to put Michael Red on there. That's a good. That was a you pulled that out. I, I had it written down. I, I saw the questions beforehand. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm gonna say you already had the answers. <laughs> I'm gonna say I don't know. Uh, I don't necessarily. I don't know a ton about Peja necessarily, um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna roll with your form. Maybe I maybe I'm like hopefully I'm knocking on the door one day. I, I feel like I shoot it well. Oh, you you're gonna knock on the door. I have no doubt. Um, Connor Clark writes, should the NBA adapt a policy where player coaches are allowed to speak their minds about refereeing decisions? Mm. I'm curious to get the active players take on this. Ah, that's sticky. sticky. <laughs> I don't know if we want that. He's I don't know. Look, if he's looking at his that. wallet. I, listen, no, no, I'm not looking. At it's, I'm not he's, looking saying, at he's saying is we're not going to, we wouldn't get fined. We wouldn't get fined. I, I would say it can get sticky because there are so many times in an NBA game where I feel like the refs were awful. And then I go back and watch and I'm like, they weren't that bad or I'm, I'm overreacting. I'm dramatic. So like in the moment I'm screaming at the ref, this happens all the time where I'm watching film and I can see a ref made a call that really pissed me off and I'm stuck on it for five plays. I'm still arguing with the ref. And then I'm like watching film. Like, why am I still on that? Like it wasn't even that serious. It didn't affect the game that much. I let it affect the game more. Uh, by continuing those conversations. So I do feel like in the heat of the moment, it's hard because, again, I truthfully do feel I'm not just saying this because because I don't want to get fined or whatever. I, like, I do think that NBA refs are the best refs in sports. It, it's a really hard job. Refereeing is a really hard job, and we're moving so fast, and it's hard to, you know, officiate um, the guys, the elite players in this league um, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the level that they do. Um, but... I don't. I don't think so because I feel like we can get caught in the heat of the moment and say things that we don't mean, and that can, you know, now, now, like a ref might be thinking about what you said, and 
And no, I, I'm not a fan. I think that if we allowed players and coaches to get on a microphone after the game with no repercussions for their evaluations of referees, that it would be an unmitigated disaster. And the reason is, is because as Tyrese just spoke on, you are talking about coming from a place of emotion. And when you're emotional, you say things you will regret later. And the byproduct of that then becomes you've got personal beef with the referee. And there's things that ha- that get said between players and referees. Like there's definitely players that don't like certain referees and there's definitely referees that don't like certain players. Right. Once those things are said publicly, oh, it's a wrap. It's a wrap. It's, it'd be a terrible yeah, there's thing. There's no going back on it. It'd be a terrible thing. Yeah. It'd be a terrible thing. I um, do think... Go ahead. I, what do you think about what do you think about um, the questions I always posed? What do you think about referees getting asked questions after games? What is your take on that? I love it. Don't we have we have pool rep- like a pool referee that they get to a- yeah. they are asked about certain things, <laughs> but the idea of them going to a press conference I think would be hilarious. It'd be great. It'd be great. You don't yeah, like? I it. just I think the discourse would still be trash because it's like referees are human and they and they you know how many times they come to you in a game like i missed that one oh yeah you know yeah, what i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. and like and and that's okay i just feel like you know social media world we're in it's like how do you miss that one you know you know what i mean no, you're never going to be you, I'm happy sure, but i do think there's a world where it makes sense I, i'm i'm sure you've had referees not even just in the same game like i'll 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 not get into it but like i'll have a very disputed call or non call with a referee and then don't see them for three weeks. And then I'm, you know, on the road in Minnesota and they'll come up to me in warm ups and be like, hey man, I, I fucked that one up. I'm really sorry. I I think the the not the issue, but the the impetus for like any sort of communication between the referees and the public should be about transparency. And I know they're trying with the last two minute report. I know they're trying with the pool report, you know, the pool reporting. I know they're trying on Twitter. <laughs> they're trying on Twitter. They're, they are, I will commend them. They are genuinely trying to make an effort to be more transparent, which is something that I think both players and fans have wanted for a long time. For sure. Um, all right, this is from Raj uh, Singh. Raj underscore Singh. Uh, was Tyrese really calling for a fake screen to freeze Malik Beasley in that viral vid, or was he just attacking early before Miles set the screen? Uh, I was calling for a screen. I definitely was calling for a screen, um, but he was kind of slow. I think I don't even know if Miles was in the game. Maybe it was Isaiah Jackson. I don't remember. But I feel like they were kind of slow to it, and I, I knew that if he turned his head, I would be able to attack there before he got there. Um, and it felt like when I pointed there, maybe he wasn't even going to come up. Maybe he was telling me no. So I just kind of used that to my advantage. But I didn't even know that that happened until that clip got posted after because I would have shot it. I didn't know that he wasn't right behind me in the moment. And it makes me look smarter than I than I am. I'm, I, mean, like I, I didn't do nothing crazy. I think that <laughs> he just thought a screen was there and it wasn't. Um, but I, don't, I just think the screen wasn't coming. My one reaction to it, did you – do you remember in the moment – I, and I, I can't remember who was the big in the in in the screen action that was defending whoever was setting the screen on you. But did you hear the big call out any coverages? Right, left, no, strong, no, weak. No, no, no screen. No, no, <laughs> there no was nothing, nothing. That was called. It was just the point. Then that's what threw him off. It wasn't the call. Yeah, because <laughs> I, dude, I played on teams where in that middle pick and roll, I liked how Stan did it, which was strong and weak. And it doesn't matter if the player's strong hand is the right hand. It doesn't matter if the player's uh, strong hand is his left hand. Strong meant you were pushing the ball to the right side of the court. Weak meant you were pushing the ball to the left side of the court. I hated when people started doing right-left. It was a, I, literally one of my pet peeves where coaches would be like, we're going to call right-left. The big is going to call right-left. Okay, sounds good in theory. Sounds really good in theory. But then all of a sudden, what if your big in the moment is calling your right shoulder? But he means 
to call the defender's right hand. And I get right. confused. Or what if the big calls it right and I get confused? Like, there's so many things that can go wrong with right left. I hated it. And I'm I didn't never got froze like Malik Beasley, but I definitely got confused sometimes. And they spe- then all of a sudden you're guarding a left handed player. God forbid. Your whole brain's backwards. Yeah, it was it was interesting with USA this year too. Uh, um because everybody comes from different teams, everybody sets it up differently, but kind of having to see that adjustment for Jaron of calling like strong I think we did strong week at USA and I think that they do strong week for the Grizzlies, but I think that they change it depending on the ball handler. Oh, maybe. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like if like right, if you're guarding Manu talking- Ginobili, strong means you send him left, weak means you send him right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, think yeah, yeah. that's how Memphis does it or something. And yeah. that's not how we were doing it for USA. And it was interesting seeing that adjustment for him. And, and I think for us guarding the ball, like some guys like, oh, we call right or left. And then and then as you said, some guys were like, oh, we call right. That means the screen is coming on your right or left. The screen is coming on your left. Like everybody kind of did it differently. So that, that was an interesting, uh, interesting little dynamic with USA. Can I ask you a USA question? Because I was with you for part of it. What was yeah. the Ant experience like then? What is it like now? I think I think you guys at the time could tell just that he was sort of taking this leap, but seeing what he's done, you, you just mentioned the, the T-Wolves, and they're going to have two All-Stars. Can you talk about this? You've known him for a long time. You've been close to him for a long time, but can you talk about where he is now as a player? Yeah, I mean, the Ant is amazing. Like, the stuff that he does on the floor is ridiculous. Like, that first game against Germany – where he just took over the whole second half. That was like the greatest performance I've ever seen in person. I was like almost in awe. I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, I was like, bro, you look like it's like the bean right now. Like the one he (laughs) shot the baseline fade and double pumped over Schroeder. I was like, no, that's like, in the moment, I was like, no way, no way you even thought about doing that. Like, that's ridiculous. Uh, Like seeing him every day, the way he works and, um, you know, his approach to the game and the competitor that he is, like the five on five runs we had were always like elite. And like his, it felt like his team was always majority of the time when went in and like he was defending, like he, he can do everything. Uh, I think Ann is, you know, probably the best player in his position, uh, future of the league for sure. Um, so just to be there with him and see him uh, every day was, was very special. And it's no surprise that he's doing what he's doing and it ain't going to stop for a long time. How soon until he's legit, undisputed top five player? Because it's going to happen at some point. Yeah, I would say probably like three or three years, maybe two or three years, probably. Like he he can defend too. That's what separates him. Like he is an elite, he elite defender. Like that's the thing with Minnesota. Him and Jaden our elite point of attack defenders. Then you got Rudy behind them. Um, yeah. And, and special. I, I, I give it two or three years. Yeah. Um, Jetty B plane writes, do you feel players nowadays are taught to know offense and not offense? I think Jetty B plane meant to write. <laughs> do you feel players nowadays are taught to know offense and not defense? Um, seems like a simple question. But I actually want to get into this a little bit. You guys, as Tommy mentioned, number one offense in the league, uh, struggling a little bit defensively, uh, back-to-back fifty balls by you know your your uh, opponents. I think when people watch the NBA, a casual observer, when they watch the NBA and they see a bunch of three-point shots going up, and they see people getting blown by, right? They think it's literally a lack of defense. And I have an issue with this because I think the NBA is much more sophisticated and complicated than the levels at which most people played, which was college basketball and high school basketball. The difficulty of guarding the greatest athletes in the world in space um, is often overlooked. And all our league now is space. All our league now is pace. Nearly everyone on the court can shoot or you don't have to guard them. And those people stick out like a sore thumb. The answer to a pick and roll when you're surrounded by shoot, like even with you and Miles Turner, like the answer, okay, Miles Turner is going to pop 
But then sometimes he doesn't and he rolls. It's like, let's go get a late veer. Oh shit, Miles Turner rolled this time. Like there it's incredibly complicated. And so if you can't process all these things happening at once, you don't play in the NBA. There's a reason that offenses are on an uptick, and it's not because they're not being taught defense. It's because these guys are so fucking good and everyone can shoot and everybody plays in space because they can shoot. And it's not for lack of effort or for lack of teaching. Like I just think it's really hard to get stops in the NBA. Not to mention the fact that there's guys like Joel Embiid, you know, Nikola Jokic, Luka Doncic. Like, these guys are otherworldly offensive players. Some of the best offensive players of all time, in my opinion. This is not about not being taught defense or not wanting to play defense. Like, you can't guard Joel Embiid if there's four shooters on the court. It's impossible. Yeah. As a fact, and I think that something that's downplayed is freedom of movement. Like in the NBA today, you can't, you can't touch anybody defensively. Well, like, hold on a second. How do you mean by that? Cause I'm I mean, look, I'm, I'm at the, I'm sitting courtside at the game Saturday. I'm watching Dennis Schroeder pick up full court. He's got his hands on everybody. I mean, if I'm it, not me, but yeah. there are certain guys in the NBA, if they drive and, and you put two hands on them, they are elite at selling. They're elite yeah. at ripping through and, you know, getting your arm caught, which I feel like we're at a time right now where we have some of the best players ever at that. Whereas there wasn't, I feel like players today are better than that than they've ever been in any era of, you know, ripping through hands, finding hands and kind of going through that. But I, I think that in space, like full court, you're allowed to, you know, get into guys, be physical. But I feel like when driving, it's, it is so tough. Like, Giannis shot 20 free throws against us, 18, I think. He was 16 to 18. And, like, when a guy like that is running full speed at you, what are you supposed to do? Because, like, if you back up, you're going to dunk it. And sometimes if you're, like, and you try to stand him up, they're going to call – it's a foul. because it, it, it probably is a foul. Like, I'm not saying out of the 18 free throws that none of them were fouls. Honestly, he probably should have shot 22, 24, realistically. <laughs> but, like, like, what are you supposed to do when a guy's doing – like right, Joel, and, you, and if you Joel build the shot. wall, he's going to kick out to three. Like Joel, by the way, exactly. is, is literally. I, I I mean, Harden for years was the best, but like Joel is the best. Like he had one against you guys last night, where you guys are doubling. He's baiting it, and then he kicks out. Does that a couple times, and then he sees that the double guy is taking a terrible angle, and he goes right be- between them, and he does the little rip through the low gather. Foul, two shots, right? You do it all the I time, too, when you go to your right hand. Oh, you do it all I'm the time. I'm going low rip every time. If I see you, I'm going low rip every time. Yeah. But the, this is the, the thing that makes me the, the sickest uh, defensively. CP used to do it, and Joel does it now. They catch it, they, they see the hand guarding them like this. They rip through, and they don't even attempt a shot. They just walk to the free throw line. <laughs> I'd be so mad. I'd be like, oh, my God. He didn't even attempt to shoot it. Like, he's just so smart. CPs do it all the time. CP, catch it. See, there's four fouls about to be in the bonus. Uh, not even shoot it. Just walk right to the free throw line. Be like, oh, my. This guy, man. Like, and then, and God, then, what are you supposed and to then do? tell you how, how stupid you are for not knowing the scouting report. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's so frustrating. What'd you, Todd, what'd you see um, from the Spurs? You guys played them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can talk about how ridiculous Wemby is. Some of the shots he shoots, and like, there's just certain like you can't. What do you What are you supposed to do? Like, I think Obi fouled him on a turnaround fadeaway, and I was like, "Bro, you're never gonna block it. You're not blocking a jump shot from him. Just like, there's no reason to swing through. Just put it straight in air. If you swing through, you're gonna foul him every time. Um, it's interesting. They're a young group. Uh, I think they um, they've tried to play through Wemby a little bit more. Um, it's a little different. I think I feel like. Um, the approach has to be a little different for them to 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 run more things through him, but I feel like he's learning right now and just understanding the nuances. He he fouls a lot right now, uh, but the more he plays, he's going to be better. Like I look forward to playing him at the end of the. I'm sure we play him later in the season. He's going to be a completely different player playing at a higher level. So I'm excited to see that. But he does some things on the floor where you're just like, what was that? Like it's he does some ridiculous things where. Yeah, there's nothing you can do except get out the net and go the other way. 
Tyrese, I want to answer this question, but I want to get your perspective on it first. Uh, this is from I am Matt Plowman, or maybe it's Matt Plowman. Um, either way, why do some elite shooters resist moving off ball uh, for catch and shoot threes? Is it ego? Is it energy? I feel like it's a loaded question, though. No? I feel like um, it depends on the person, but it also, I think, depends on like capabilities a little bit. Also, how the offense is ran. Some guys, I, I guess, like James, for example, right? Like he's not necessarily a a catch and shoot guy. Like I feel like sometimes in the scouting report, it looks like he's not a catch and shoot. He, I mean, for the first couple of games with LA, he wasn't shooting the catch and shoot. He was going for the one dribble. I know Mikhail blocked him the one time in the corner against Brooklyn. Um, like he's not just naturally not a catch and shoot guy because he's been so dominant at being one of the best shooters ever off the dribble. That's what he does. It gets him in his rhythm. He gets to his spot, knocks it down. Like people see what Steph does or what you do or did, sorry, or, or what other uh, shooters off the move do. Like that's not easy. That's not easy. That takes a lot of energy, but also is it implemented offensively? Mm. Like, the guys aren't just flying off pin like not every team's running like an away action for a pin down for a shooter not every team is running that um like duncan is another guy who's a lead at it in the league today um it, it, i feel like sometimes it depends it depends on what you're running offensively but i think that sometimes yeah it's it's definitely an energy thing dudes aren't like for me like i i don't play a ton off the ball um like i would like to play more off the ball sometimes because uh, it kind of gets me more in like that scoring mode to be downhill and kind of can pass at the last minute. But like sometimes that's just not what's needed for us offensively. It's me to have the ball and figure it out that way. So it, it, again, it's it's not easy. Like the nuances of your whole life, you when you shoot, when we do like shooting workouts or just like, you know, before practice, after practice, whatever, it's just catch and shoot, then it's off the dribble. But nobody's like, like JJ, to be honest, like outside of like you, Duncan, Steph, Clay, Buddy, maybe like I've never. You guys, are the only guys I've played or that I play against in the NBA that yeah. are flying off of pin downs. Like when I first got in the league out and I was I guarded you my rookie year, you were flying, and I was like, "Is this what it's like?" And I was like, "There's not many people like this." You know, <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's just there's just not that many guys anymore. Well, I, I think you answered that really well because I, I do think it requires a different conditioning and a different level of energy, and like a desire to play that way. But the point about offensive schemes, it, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing. Tommy brought this up last year when we were talking about draft prospects. And I said, well, you know, there's not really a, a, like Joel Embiid and Nikola Jokic are anomalies. Nobody plays for the post anymore. Why would you want to, it's not a knock on a big anymore if they can't post, but then he's like, well, if they never get the opportunity to post, how do we know they can't post? Right. So some of it is that offenses don't run that way, but then at the same time, if you show that you can fly off a screen or fly off a pin down or, or come off a stagger screen and hit an open three, Joe Harris, for example, then you're going to get those plays called for you. And then you're going to practice them more. And then they're going to run them more because you're going to make them more. It's so it's a little bit of like what comes first, right? You, I, I think at some point you have to develop a rep reputation to be able to do that to get the play called but I was in a around enough teams that like the player development guys aren't teaching guards how to do that nobody's you know you're, you're oh, here's your pick and roll read here's your pick and roll read all right let's work on your catch and shoot all right let's work on your side step three right it's like very limited for the average guy now the stars they get to do whatever the fuck they want to do but for the average guy like that's not something that player development coaches are working on you with uh yeah so that's I, I think I think you're right I think there's the offensive call the energy and it's just generally hard yeah when you're flying off and like you would shoot you would shoot it too I think uh, or I feel like you would come off and still let your momentum be carrying you to your right and and be able to square and get back forward where and sometimes you'd have to fall right because that's just where the defense was where I feel like it's just not, like you said, it's not really taught that much. You know what I mean? Usually I feel like most teams, like you see where your shot, you you go by what the best player, the best player on the team does this. This is how we run our offense through the best player. 
this is where your shots are going to come from from your best player. Yeah. If that makes sense. Like I feel like it's just not a yeah. not a ton of pin counts. I'll throw Kyle in there. I th- Kyle was like six eight, right? Clay six six big. Um, like if you're in that six four six five range, buddy. Because him going left, he'll shoot off balance. Marco Bellinelli, who I played with, um, Steph to a degree off the, off the off the catch for sure. Um, although he shoots off balance off the dribble as well. Um, I think when you're smaller, like it's a necessity. Like everybody is talking about, like oh, your base isn't good. And I'm like, no, dude. Like if I did perfect lower body and was like straight up and down and didn't lean and all that bullshit, my shot's getting blocked. I have to survive. It's a matter of uh, of you know survival that I had to shoot that way, and 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 how certain guys have to shoot that way. Do you think that that's hard for some guys? That part of the question was the ego thing. It's hard for some guys to understand that because if you're if you've been the best shooter your whole life, no matter where you are, yeah, middle school, high school, college, whatever it is, and you're you know you're the best in the gym, and all of a sudden you're not. The survival thing is not always a thing that people comes to them naturally. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's probably part of it. Don't get discouraged, young players. Don't get discouraged. <laughs> Keep Ty, working. Ty, we have to ask about this because we got a lot of, don't get mad, but we got a lot of questions about it. Uh, Real True writes in about the Hornets, the last play in the Hornets game. Um, yeah. What happened? Because you were playing fucking awesome that whole game, and then it just kind of went to win haywire at the end. Yeah, so obviously we tried to get, we got the switch. Um and I did an awful, awful job of clock management and getting guys where I needed them to be. Usually when I'm in – I've been in that situation probably three or four times in my NBA career. Every time it's been a tie game. So it's like when I shoot it, I just need to get one off before the buzzer. If I miss it, we go to overtime anyway. That was the first time I've really been in that situation while we're losing. Um, but watching the film back, Brendan Miller did a really good job of kind of they, – they were they were doubling me for the majority of the third and fourth when I got the switch. So like Brandon Miller, he kind of kept running up. I could hear Cliff behind me yelling hit, which is most teams in the NBA call double. So I I hear Cliff calling hit. So I'm, I'm like waiting for Miller to come up so I can go left and Bruce Brown was going to fill up and I was going to read two on the backside. Brandon Miller kept stunting and stunting and stunting. I don't know if that's what they wanted from him, but it worked because I was like, I'm staring at him, waiting for him to come. And I look at the clock. And I'm like, oh, shit, there's five seconds. And then I go, as he cross, hits my leg, and I should have called timeout. I knew we had a timeout. Uh, but then Mel, good hands, got the sec- got the steal, um, ended the game. I just I should have done a better job. Once I knew that he wasn't going to come, I should have just got everybody flat, got to the middle of the floor to allow myself to play anywhere I wanted to. Uh, but I was too busy reading the help side the whole time that I didn't just go. Um so, so yeah, I was very, very, very sick about that one uh, uh, after. But, you know, he did what he had to do. And we're going to end there. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is there any more e- uh, emails from I hate Google Docs at Gmail? Okay, Tyrese, last question, the rowback question. Reminder to our viewers, you can use the code OLD on rowback.com for 20% off your first purchase. That's R-H-O-B-A-C-K.com, code OLD. You guys know I wear the gear all the time. We're trying to get Tommy in it, but he chooses to wear vintage Brooklyn Dodgers gear. Um, I'm going to answer this one question too. This is from Josh Cox, long longtime listener. Uh, Tyrese, you and I are in a three-on-three tournament as teammates. Who's the third player that you select and why to be our teammate and win this three-on-three tournament? I'll go first. Neither Tyrese or I play any defense. Let's be clear. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be clear. I actually I mean, I thought about this. I actually thought about this, and I was like, "Who would I want as the third player?" Um, and assuming I get to pick who I'm guarding, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, it's not like me versus me, you, and the, our third player versus like Luca, Kyrie, and Kevin Durant, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm like guarding someone of similar <laughs> sort of stature here. Uh my initial thing was like, I, I I think I'd like to play with Jokic. But then I was like, you know what? I might need I might need a little more rim protection. So then I was like, I'd probably be a Joel Embiid, right? Then I was thinking, man, 
I might want a perimeter player with some size to get a one-on-one bucket. Neither Tyrese and I are good defensive rebounders. So I'm going to go with Jason Tatum. It's my third guy. Wow. And that is not wow. saying Jason Tatum is the best player in the world, so we're clear. I'm just saying. The Duke connection's real. <laughs> I want him on my three. Yeah, right. Uh, it's pretty easy for me. I thought Joel right away. Rim protection. Uh, one-on-one, get a bucket. I mean, there's not many people who are defending him. One-on-one, like you're probably going to send a double, and I have confidence in both of us as shooters. Uh-huh. So I'm going with Joel because I don't really think people are guarding him one-on-one. Nobody is. Um, he can score, and I feel like he uh, he likes us, so he'll be a willing passer. I yeah on second thought i'd probably go joel too now i'm trying to picture tatum guarding joel in the post yeah that's not great that's not great all right let's go joel tyrese <laughs> always fun man it's always good to see you always good to chat uh we'll see you soon bud yeah i appreciate you guys yeah thanks bro